Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, today's webinar on how to edit 360 photos like a pro uh, pre presented by Shanil Kavol. Um, so I just have a little bit of housekeeping right now. Um, because of the encoding that Big Marker is using, it, it's um, to bring you a better experience, uh, we recommend using Chrome or Firefox. So um, yeah, my name is Karen Ladisi, and uh, I'm the vice president here at the IVRPA. Um, that is what we call, um, uh, for short, our <laughs> nonprofit organization, International Virtual Reality Professionals Association. Yes. So um, we are, like I said, a nonprofit organization. We are supported by our members and our sponsors, and it's operated entirely by volunteers. So um, we provide resources uh, in nearly all aspects of 360 panoramic photography and videography, and we're really happy to offer this webinar to um, not only our members, but to um, you know, our friends around the world. So, like I said, Shanil Kawal is giving our presentation today. He's uh, based in London. He's a 360 video creator and trainer, um, and he has uh, a wealth of knowledge on his YouTube channel called Best360. Um, this is a great place to go for learning about 360 cameras um, how, and how to use them creatively. Um, there's a lot of information there, so we recommend visiting his YouTube channel. Um, so whether you're new to 360 or video making in general, uh, uh, Shanil believes that anyone can learn 360 and, you know, so, so you can, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we're going to, um, let Shanil take the, take the reins here soon. Um, but at any time you have a question, uh, feel free to use the Q&A tab. There's a special Q&A tab, um, and uh, this way, we, this is where we're going to be looking for the questions, and we can mark them answered, and it just makes everything a little bit easier for us. Um, and uh, we'll um, alert Shanil if he doesn't see your question. We'll let him know that they're coming in, and um, and we'll also have a Q&A afterwards. So stick around till the end if you want to um, have a, a Q&A. And uh, just as a gentle reminder, this uh, webinar is being recorded, and the video will be posted to our, our website and to our YouTube site um, in a few days when we get it up and going. So I think that's it from me. I'm going to uh, change it over to Shanil and uh, have a great time, and I hope you uh, enjoy it. All right. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, to talk to you all about 360 cameras and how to edit 360 photos. And um, yes, some of you may know me already from my YouTube channel, Best360, uh, trying to help anyone and everyone uh, learn how to use their 360 cameras creatively. And that motto kind of comes from what I was doing uh, before COVID. Um, I, I work in schools helping 10 year olds learn how to make videos. So I need to make sure that it's very easily understandable, uh, it's fun and it's engaging. And that's all that experience is translated uh, into my YouTube channel to make it really easy and fun. So if you have any questions uh, throughout this presentation, feel free to drop it uh, in the Q and A tab and I will answer them as soon as I can. So. In this presentation, I wanted to talk to you about uh, right from the be as a beginner, as if you know, ten-year-olds are on this call. You know, what is a three hundred and sixty camera? What is a three hundred and sixty photo? Talk about three hundred and sixty cameras which shoot the best photos. What equipment do you need? What are the best practices? And then we'll talk about the typical photo workflow and the workflow to make a time-lapse video as well. So, let's jump right in. So you probably have a 360 camera like the One X, the One X2, uh, the One R, or the QCam 8K. And all of these cameras have two lenses. So you've got a front lens and a back lens. 
each of these lenses can see more than 180 degrees, which means it can even see behind itself. So if you look on the slide, you can see that when a 360 camera takes a photo, this is the front lens and this is the back lens. So that's what's being taken by the camera. Now, the next step is to turn this photo into an echo rectangular format. So using the camera software, so for example, with an Insta360 camera, you'd be using Insta360 Studio to turn that double fisheye look into an echo rectangular photo like this. And this is the format you need to upload your 360 photos onto social media uh, like Facebook. This is the format that's recognized uh, by all the platforms online. So I'm sure you've seen a world map and the world is round. So to represent something that's a sphere, uh, in a rectangular format so that we can see it as a flat view is like the world map. It's an echo rectangular format. And that's what 360 photos are. An echo rectangular photo is just a flat way of seeing a sphere. And that's how you turn a, you know, an echo rectangular photo into something that's a sphere. So when you upload an echo rectangular photo onto Facebook, um, that's what the user will see when they're scrolling through their feed. You'll see the front view or the left view or the right view. They can then look around their 360 photo. So without getting into too much detail, um, I think that the best consumer cameras for photos would be probably at the number one spot is the Ricoh Z1 because it has the one inch sensor, uh, which the larger the sensor, the more information the camera collects, which will give you a photo with more dynamic range, um, which results in a better photo in low light and daylight. Second place, I'd probably give it to the QCam 8K uh, because it has a half inch sensor. And probably third place, I'd give it to the One X2, which has a smaller sensor. So let's talk about some best practices when taking a 360 photo. So 360 cameras can shoot two types of photo. One is a raw photo and one is a JPEG photo. A raw photo will give you the most information about your photo. And a JPEG photo is a compressed version, which means it's a smaller file size, which has less information about your photo. So if you want to have the most dynamic range, the most colors and the most clarity in your photo, you need to shoot with RAW. And I'll show you the difference it makes a little bit later. There's another photo mode called HDR photo mode. And this will take three photos simultaneously. One that is too dark, one that is exposed well, and one that is and one that is too bright. Then these photos are merged together into a single photo to make a high dynamic range photo. And it's best to use HDR photo mode when there are extreme bright and dark areas in your scene. So here's an example. So when a 360 camera takes a HDR photo, this is it takes three photos. One of them is normal exposure, which you can see over here. So just notice how the sky is blown out. The second photo it takes is one that is too dark. And the reason it takes one that is too dark is so that it can capture the brighter areas of the scene, just like the sky. So now we have the sky clearly exposed in this underexposed photo. And the third photo it takes is one that is too bright. So here, the ground and under the tree leaves is exposed well, but obviously the sky is too bright. So now that we've got three photos, one with a nice sky, one with a nice ground, a nice detail in the trees, and we've got one with kind of nice water with a normal exposure, 
if you combine all these three photos together on the computer, we will now get a HDR photo. So now the sky, the ground, the water, the detail in the trees is all exposed really well. So whenever you're in a situation where there's a lot of bright and dark areas, use HDR photo mode and it will capture all the information in the bright and darker areas. And in comparison, this is a standard photo. So you can see that the sky is blown out. If I go back, this is the HDR photo. So you can see there's detail in the sky and you can see all the branches and leaves in the background. Another thing you'll need to do is make sure that your camera has less or no shake whatsoever. So it's best to put your 360 camera still on a monopod, especially if you're shooting in low light. And this will get rid of any shake or blur and it will give you the sharpest photo quality possible. And never hold the 360 camera in your hand to take a photo because your hand is way too close to the lens. So your hand will appear really big at the bottom of the photo. So you definitely wanna put it on a stand so that there will be nothing underneath it. When you put your, when you upload your photo onto social media, you want people to have a natural viewing experience. So you want them to experience your photo as if they are there themselves. So to do this, you want the camera to be eye level. And what is the correct height for eye level? It kind of depends uh, in each country, depending on the height average, but generally about 150 centimeters to about 180 centimeters is where your camera height should be. Now you can create you can use different heights to create different perspectives. So if you're trying to do something like show a animal point of view, like a squirrel, then you might actually just mount uh, the camera on the ground. And then we can see what a small animal can see from their perspective, or you might want to mount it on a drone to see a very high perspective. Now, when 360 photos are taken, normally you don't see anyone in the photo. That means that the person taking the photo needs to hide. And if you want to take a photo and you don't want to be in it, it's probably best to hide so that you don't have to edit yourself out of it. But when you hide, you just need to be careful of a couple of things. So, you know, try and find something that's close to you uh, where you can hide. So in the previous example where I took it in the forest, I purposely found a really big tree because I knew that I'd be hiding behind that tree. Um, and it was I was very close to the camera. So if there was animals or people coming by, I would be able to react and quickly get to the uh, camera before anything knocked it over. Yeah, make sure there is no hazards around you like animals or children, because you know once they knock over uh, your camera, you smash a lens, you have to replace it. So just be aware of your surroundings before you leave your camera unattended. Be careful of gusts of wind. Um, this is probably the number one mistake that newbies make when taking photos. So make sure you put a lot of weight uh, on your monopod so that it keeps it grounded. And you can use um, different kind of weights. You can use ankle weights, you can use um, lifting weights just to make sure that it doesn't fall over. And I think the best way to see what your 360 camera is doing, especially if you're trying to take a photo in the city, is to monitor what your 360 camera can see on your phone when you're taking a photo. So then you can just keep scrolling around, looking at the preview to make sure that there's no one trying to approach your camera or you don't see someone with a skateboard coming really fast towards your camera. Um, so you can react and go to your camera if you know, there's any hazards. So definitely monitor from your phone. So automatic exposure settings and manual exposure settings, which one should you use? It depends. So for outdoors, the camera usually does a good job 
of choosing the correct auto exposure settings. It will choose the lowest ISO and the lowest ISO gives you the cleanest photo and it will pick the right shutter speed uh, to make sure that your scene is exposed correctly. But for indoors and low light situations, I highly recommend that you learn how to use manual exposure settings because this will help you get the best uh, photo quality. So what you wanna do is set your ISO as low as possible for a cleaner photo. We're not gonna cover manual exposures in this presentation because it's, it's quite big, but I do have a video on my YouTube channel which will show you how to use ISO and shutter speed to make sure you get the cleanest video and it also works for photo as well. But the rule of thumb, keep your ISO low. Remember that, keep it on ISO 100 and you'll get the cleanest photo possible. Stitch line. So which position should your 360 camera face when you're taking a 360 photo? Does it matter? The answer is yes. So let's say the sun is over here and your 360 camera lens is facing the, the sun like this. The best way to position the 360 camera is actually to position the stitch line towards the sun. And this will make sure that both lenses get an equal amount of light. Because if the sun was just hitting one lens, you'd have one lens that's really bright, one lens that's really dark, and then you would see the exposure difference in the stitch line. So you want to make sure that wherever your light source is, the brightest light source, point the stitch line towards that light source, and then the light will spread equally across both lenses, and then you'll get a much more seamless stitch line. And I think one of the things that stops beginners from taking photos and sharing their photos online is that they think that the quality is not good enough. So I want you to rethink this. And instead of saying to yourself, is the quality good enough? I want you to think about, is the story or message clear enough? So let's take a look at this example on Facebook 360. And they shared a photo of a really tall, big statue. Now, their message is pretty clear. They want to show how huge this statue is. And so they described it at 112 feet tall. Look how big this statue is. Now, if you look carefully in the photo, you can actually see uh, there's a stitch line error, but that doesn't matter because they're trying to show something that's extremely fascinating. So if your photo has something really cool to share, like look at this huge statue, it's this big, it's this wide, then that's what people want from your photo. They're not looking for the quality, they're actually looking for the message or story. And think about how can you make your story or message clearer? So in this example where there's a statue, I think it could have been made even clearer if someone stood in front of the statue so we could see the size comparison between a human being and this statue. So then we can say, ah, if a human's this big, then this statue is huge because it's that big. So think about ways, if you're trying to convey, okay, this is a really big statue, what can you do in that moment to show people this is a huge statue? So in this case, I think someone could have stand, stood in front of that statue to show the size difference. So don't think about the quality, think about is the storage and message clear enough? And this has over 100 shares and a lot of comments. So hopefully, if there's one thing you take away today, just think about your story or message and not the quality. Okay, so workflow. How do you edit 360 photos? Before I get into workflow, feel free to ask any questions on best practices or anything so far. Okay, so Ricardo, I will answer your questions a little bit later when I get to the end of the workflow. So thank you for your questions and I'll definitely get back to it. 
All right, so what's the workflow to edit 360 photos? First, we already talked about how to shoot a raw 360 photo. So on any of these cameras, you need to find the mode which says uh, you want to shoot a raw photo and take a photo. The next step is to stitch your raw 360 photo. So what I mean by stitching is, this is the raw photo out of a 360 camera, and this is a stitched 360 photo. So if you have an Insta360, Ricoh, or GoPro Max, or QCam photo, they will all come like this with this double fisheye lens view. And then you must use their software. So if you're using QCam, use QCam Studio. If you're using Insta360, uh, use Insta360 Studio, et cetera, to turn this fisheye lens view into this echo rectangular format. Okay, so let me just find the workflow slide again. Right. So after you've stitched your echo rectangular photo, the next step is to color grade your 360 photo. And we're going to do that in Photoshop in this example. And I'm going to show you how to remove the nadir from the 360 photo. And then I'll share with you how to export the 360 photo from Photoshop, which is ready to upload online. So one question from Marco, which camera provides RAW? So the One X2 provides RAW, the One X, the One R, the QCam 8K, uh, the Ricoh Z1, Ricoh 5, Ricoh Theta. The only camera that does not provide RAW is the GoPro Max. So any other camera but the GoPro Max. All right, so let me show you what a raw photo looks like on the computer. So I need to turn on my screen share. So hopefully you can see my screen now. Can someone confirm they can just see my screen? All right, cool. So this is a raw DNG file. So this is a raw photo. This is what it looks like. And remember, the first step is to stitch this photo together from the fisheye lens view to the echo rectangular view. So because I took this on the One X2, I'm going to open Insta360 Studio and import it into there first so I can stitch it. So I'll just drag this DNG into Insta360 Studio. And it's over here. So this is the raw photo. And you can see what it looks like in Insta360 Studio. Just take a look at this uh, sun area at the moment. It looks blown out now, but when we look at it later, uh, it will look a little different and it won't look as blown out. So just bear this in mind, see all this blown out area over here, and this will change a little bit later. And this is the power of a raw photo. If you took a JPEG photo, this is probably what you're going to see. It would look like this. So to stitch this raw photo, I'm going to hit the export button in the top right hand corner. I'm going to export this as a photo. And I'm just going to select the folder, which my photos was in to export it to there. And select this folder and click OK. So now I should have an echo rectangular photo. Which is this file over here. And the next step is now for me to open this in Photoshop. So I'm going to open Photoshop. And then we'll take a look at this echo rectangular photo.
And I'm just going to drag the DNG into Photoshop. And now you can see we've gone from a double fisheye lens view to an echo rectangular format photo. Now remember I told you about the blown out sun. Now take a look at the sun and you can see that the sun now blends very nicely into the sky. And that's the power of a raw photo. It's actually saved that dynamic range between the sun and the sky. It doesn't look blown out. It's actually a very nice gradual fade. So raw photos are definitely the way forward uh, to get the best photo quality possible. I'm just gonna check the big marker screen in case there's any questions. Okay. So now we're inside Photoshop. The next step is to color grade this photo. And one of the easiest ways to start color grading is actually to press this auto button in the top right hand corner. So if I click it, it will give you a really good starting point. It's just brightened up the photo and made it pop a little bit. So now we've got all these tabs to go through and see what they can do, but you don't need to play around with all of it. The auto tab actually does a really good job and sometimes auto is all I need uh, to publish my photo. But if you wanna make more tweaks, let's just go through basic. So this is the white balance option. So the temperature will make your photo appear more cool, so more blue or if I drag the slider to the other side, it will make it more warm and orange. So when you click auto, the computer will figure it out for you. And it's already said that this is the correct white balance. But if you want to make a tweak to make your picture more warm or cool, you can play with the slider over here. And I think the best way for you to learn about what each of these options does is just to play with this slider, move it left and right, and move it to the extreme end so you can see the impact it's having on the photo. And if you want to reset the slider, you can just double click on the arrow and it will go back to the center. So as you saw there, the exposure will make the photo darker or brighter. And if I drag the contrast to the left, you can see the photo go more flat and if I drag it all the way to the other side, you can see that it becomes more punchy. And I'll double click to reset it. If I drag the highlights all the way to the other side, you can see the sun becoming more white and it's starting to blend in with the sky. So if I drag it down, we can see more detail in the sun. And with the shadows, if we look in the tree areas, and I bring it down, you can see the photo getting darker. If I drag it up, you can see it becoming more brighter. So depending on the look and feel that you're trying to create, you can just be play with these settings and see you know, which style suits uh, what you're, you're looking for. And let's play with the whites and see what it does. So if I drag the white slider down, just look at the white areas of the photo. You can see the white areas get brighter or darker. And with the blacks, if you look at the darker areas of the photo, if I bring it down, you can see the darker areas get darker, the blacks. And if I bring it up, you can see the darker areas get brighter. For with texture, I'm just going to zoom in and you can zoom in by double clicking. And if you press space bar on the keyboard, you can move around your photo. I'm going to decrease the texture so you can see the impact it makes. And I'll bring it to the other side. So the difference I'm seeing is that if I bring the texture down, it looks a little bit more dreamy. And if I bring it all the way up, it looks a little bit more sharp. So I'm just gonna reset it. I think it looks fine as it is. Let's play with the clarity. If I bring it down, 
it's kind of taken away the sharpness. It looks more dreamy again. And if I bring it up, I can see things becoming a little bit more sharp. But I honestly think that to get the best quality out of these cameras, I do like I do like it to look like what it came out of the camera. So I leave most of these at zero, but if you have a particular style that you're going for, then you just need to play with these sliders to get your style. Now with vibrance and saturation, these, these both affect the colors, but they affect the colors in different ways. So if I increase the vibrance, this will increase the colors uh, without affecting the skin tones. Now, unfortunately, there's no one in this photo, so you won't see the effect on the skin tones. But this will just kind of increase. You can see the sky get more blue, and it won't affect the kind of orange skin tones. But if I play with the saturation and bring it down, you can see the photo turn black and white. And if I bring it up, you can see it add color everywhere. So saturation will affect the skin tones and the vibrance will not affect the skin tones. So that's the difference between the two. So curve, if you're familiar with maybe a uh, gradient video, there's something called an S curve. And basically anything over here is your shadows, in the middle is your mid-tones, and over here is your highlights. So if I just drag this part of the line up, you will see the brighter parts of the photo get brighter. And if I drag this part of the line down, you'll see the darker areas get darker. And anything in between is over here. And if you want to reset this line, you can right click it and set reset regions and splits. In the detail tab, you can sharpen your photo. So if I zoom in, I'll set it to zero sharpening so you can see the difference. There is zero and there is an extreme amount of sharpening. So I'm just gonna reset this. Now over here, you can see there is noise in the photo. So if I bring up the noise reduction to about 50, you can now see that the noise has disappeared and you can play with this setting to see how much noise reduction you want to add and how much of the grain you want to add. Let me just zoom in so you can see the difference. So this is zero noise reduction and this is 50 noise reduction. So just find the setting that works for you uh, if you wanna get rid of uh, grain in your photo and noise. And it's similar for color as well. Now the color mixer is really interesting. This is where you can do some really cool things. So hue is the colors in the photo, like blue, green, orange. Saturation is the intensity of the color and luminance is the brightness of the color. Now let's say I want to change the color of the sky. It's blue at the moment. So what I can do is make sure hue is selected, click the targeted adjustment tool. And if I click the sky and drag up, I can now change the color of the sky to purple. Or if I drag my mouse down, I can drag it to a more cyan, uh, teal and orange kind of look. So I'm gonna change it to this teal. And you can do this for any color. So let's try green. So I'm gonna click on the grass, drag my mouse up, and you can see the grass color change to a more evergreen. And if I bring it down, you can see it change to a more orangey type color. So now it looks like more of an autumn look. And just like that, you can change the colors of different things in your photo. It's really fun to play around with and you can get a lot of cool results. You can apply it to skin tones as well. Now, color grading, this is something that's uh, very similar to video. Um, so if you want to, you can change the colors in mid-tone shadows and highlights. So again, shadows is the darker areas of your photo, like these shadows over here. The highlights is like 
the sun area and the brighter parts of your photo and the midtones is everything in between. So let me just show you an example of what it does. So if I drag this down, you can see the midtones become more blue and I double click to reset it in the shadows. If I drag this to orange, you can see the darker areas become more red as I drag it towards red. And with this circle, if I drag the highlights towards blue, you'll see the brighter areas become more blue. So there's all these different settings to play with, and there is no right or wrong answer to color grading because it does depend on the look and feel that you're going for. So those are just another set of tools to play with. But honestly, I just probably stick to the basic curve and detail tab, and I don't really play with uh, anything else. But in the optics tab, there's one thing that's really useful and it's remove chromatic aberration. So I'm just gonna zoom in here and every 360 camera has this problem where in the stitch line area, you'll see this purple fringing. And if you click remove chromatic aberration, you'll see that the purple fringing has gone. So this is something you might wanna click uh, in any one of your photos to remove this purple fringing over here. So you can see the difference with and without. And geometry effects and calibration, don't need to worry about it. So let me just zoom out and I'm gonna click auto again. And auto picks the best settings for you, I think. And then if you want to, I like to just play with the colors to make the sky a different color. Um, and change the greens just to make the colors pop a little bit more. So once you're happy with your color grading, you can click open and this will open in Photoshop. And the next step is to remove the tripod from the nadir of your 360 photo. So to do this, Go to 3D, Spherical Panorama, New Panorama Layer from Selected Layer. And this will turn it into a 360 view. And if I click my mouse and drag, I can look around the 360 photo in Photoshop. And if I look down towards the nadir, you can see I have the tripod legs over here, which I need to remove. So there are a couple of ways to do this. And this is a very tricky situation as well because we have shadows. And if you want this to look realistic, we want to keep the shadows there, but get rid of this tripod and its shadow over here as well. And I'm going to zoom in by holding Alt on the keyboard and scrolling my mouse so I can see it more clearly and I'll zoom in as far as I can and just make sure the tripod leg is in the center. Over here is where you can hold down your mouse to get more tools. And there's something called the spot healing brush. Now what the spot healing brush does is it can magically remove things in your scene. So if I want to make the brush smaller, I can hit the open bracket key on my keyboard so the brush is getting smaller, or I can hit the close bracket key on my keyboard and the circle, the brush is getting bigger. Another way to do this is to go to your brush size over here and you can select the size. And I recommend setting the hardness down to 50%. And if I just click my mouse and make a selection over the tripod leg and select it like this, it will now try to, <laughs> it didn't do anything in this situation. So let me try that again. I'm gonna put the spot heating brush across the tripod legs and it will try to remove it. So, okay. 
it seems that this is too complicated for the computer, so it couldn't remove it automatically and give me a good result. So actually, I'm going to hit Control Z on the keyboard and bring this back. And we're going to use another tool instead. So if you have a simpler pattern like grass or dirt, which doesn't have lines and shadows, then using the spot healing brush would actually get rid of this tripod legs really easily. But since this is more complicated, we are going to use something called the clone stamp tool. And what this does is it will take an area in a different part of the photo and paste it where I want to. So to remove this tripod leg, I want to copy, let's say, this area and paste it here because it's the same texture. So I'm going to hold Alt on the keyboard, click here, and now if I hover my mouse over the tripod leg and click, you can see a plus icon on the screen and a circle icon. When I start to move my brush over the tripod leg, it will copy the pixels where the plus is and paste it where the circle is. So just watch the plus icon and the circle icon very carefully so you can see what's happening. So I'm gonna very carefully brush and you can see the texture from here is being pasted over here. So I can see that this area is the same as this area. So what I'm gonna do is hold the Alt key down, copy pixels from here, and try and paste it here. So if I click, look at the plus icon, that's where it's copying pixels from, and the circle is where it's copying pixels to, and I will drag across and it's starting to eliminate the tripod legs. And I can hold Alt key over here. We can copy pixels from here. And let's try and join this up. So now you can see the plus icon and the circle icon where it's taking the pixels from and where it's copying to. I can just drag up. And now we have a cleaner line. So I'm going to try and find another area that's similar to this so we can get rid of this part. So this plank and this plank look similar. So what I'm going to do is hold Alt key and take pixels from here and paste it over here. So I'm going to line it up. Click and look at the plus icon and the circle icon. And you can see where it's taken the pixels from. And that part of the tripod leg is now removed. If you want to move around your 360 photo, click the Move tool. And now I can position this part in frame. Move it around so we can see it clearly. And I'll use the Alt and scroll to zoom in. So now let's deal with this part. So again, I'll use the clone stamp tool. I'm going to take this circle part over here and paste it here since it's pretty much the same. So look at the plus icon, look at the circle icon and watch where it's taken pixels from. And I'll just brush over the shadow very carefully. And I'll find a similar area here to copy over. So let's take this area, hold the Alt key here and click. So now I'll take pixels from there and then just click here and paste those pixels. So now the tripod leg is completely gone. We've got a bit left over here. So let's take some pixels from here, and I'll just drag it over here so it's gone. We've got a shadow over here, so let's find somewhere that has similar pixels. Let's say here, 
and I'll just very carefully paste that here. And it just takes a lot of patience and precision to remove all the shadows. So you can perfect this. I mean, as a best practice, when you put the monopod down, it's probably best to think about, okay, how hard is it gonna be for me to remove uh, the shadows uh, and the nadir? So try and look for an easier texture so it's not so hard in editing. I probably made it really hard for myself here. So maybe if I better placed it, I wouldn't have to do this much work. So as a best practice, just look at the nadir so you can make it uh, much more easier for yourself as well. I'm just gonna check for questions so far. Any questions about clone stamp tool? Okay, I'll come back to these other questions in a sec. So once you are happy with your nadir removal, it's now time to export this photo from Photoshop. So to do this, click 3D, spherical panorama, export panorama, save on your computer. And I'm going to save my picture here and click save. I'm going to navigate to the folder with my picture, which is over here. And if you want to view your 360 photo, I recommend GoPro VR player. Uh, this will allow you to see your 360 photos. And then what I can do is drag my 360 photo into GoPro player. And now I can see the results. And now I can look around. You can see that the tripod legs have gone and you can perfect this if you take more time and you now have a 360 photo which is ready to upload onto social media so now you can take this equi rectangular photo over here uh, go to facebook click upload photo add this photo and it should have the uh, metadata in there already from Insta360 Studio, and it should upload as a 360 photo. So this is how you edit a raw photo, um, the quickest and easiest way to get started as a beginner. Any questions based on this workflow before I start to go through time-lapse photos? Um, I see a question from Benick360. How do you hide the selfie stick shadow under the sun without edit the photo? Um, it's, it's a really good question and it's really hard to hide the selfie stick uh, in direct sunlight because the sun will always cause uh, a shadow on the selfie stick. Now, if you film during sunrise and sunset, um, the shadows are generally uh, really long and if you film if you take a photo at midday the shadows are generally shorter so depending on the time of day you're shooting you can get away with less shadow or more shadow and if you shoot on a cloudy day you'll get zero shadow so it's only during uh, really bright sunny weather you'll get a shadow uh, when taking a photo or you can shoot uh, during soft light which is golden hour and this will reduce the amount of shadow on the ground. Okay, so there's one other thing I want to show you before I move on. So let me share my screen again.
So now that you have uh, a 360 photo, maybe um, if we look at this photo, maybe you shot it like this and the horizon is not level. And maybe you want to change uh, the center point to look uh, in the opposite direction, maybe over here instead. So how can you do that? There is a free piece of software called Hugin, and I'll open it up over here. And if you click load images in the assistant, open the photo that you just exported, then go to move drag, if you hold down shift on the keyboard, then I can drag this photo left and right and reposition this peer to be in the center of my photo so that when I upload this photo onto Facebook, for example, then this would be the center automatically. And if you want to correct the horizon, you can also move this photo up and down and you can look at the lines and you can make it straight. So you can check your horizon. And you can move the mouse left, right, up and down to make sure your horizon is straight. And once you're happy with your horizon and it's straight, like that, so I'm just looking out for the lines. So over here, you can see the pier. Go to Assistant, Create Panorama. And because this photo was taken with the Insta360 camera, I know that the width and height is 680 by 340. So you need to find out what is the highest resolution your 360 camera takes a picture in and enter those dimensions over here. Uh, change the format to JPEG so you can upload it onto social media. And for the highest quality possible, change the quality to 100 and click OK. And it will tell you that you need to save this project file before you export the photo. So click OK and save your project file. And then it will allow you to save your photo. I'll click Save. Then it will run the process to save your photo. And you now have a photo that's been centered and made straight. So you can now upload it onto social media. So that's the basic workflow for anyone to get started um, creating really high quality photos um, really quickly uh, using raw photos. And now we're going to do something that's a little bit more advanced uh, by taking lots of photos, a time lapse. And how do we put this together uh, using Premiere Pro? So I'm going to close here again, close Photoshop because we don't need that anymore. And I'm going to go to my time lapse demo. And OK. So what we're going to create here is a time lapse video. And this time lapse video is shot in raw mode, raw photo interval mode using the 1x2. Now, when the 1x2 takes interval photos or photos in general, it takes a JPEG photo and a raw photo. So in this folder, I have multiple DNG photos, which is our raw photos, and I've got an INSP file, which is our JPEG photos. I don't actually need um, the JPEG files because we want the best photo quality for our time lapse possible. So we're only going to work with the DNG files. So what I want to do is collect all my DNG files for this time lapse 
and import it into Insta360 Studio so that we can turn all these photos from their fisheye lens view to an equirectangular format again. So to do this, if you're on Windows, select Details and sort this by type. And this will put all your DNGs together. Then you can select the first DNG and hold Shift and click the last DNG. And then all your raw photos for this time lapse is selected. Then open up Insta360 Studio. I'll just clear this. And then you want to drag and drop all your raw photos into Insta360 Studio. And depending on how fast your machine is, this can take some time. So now it's going to start loading the files. So for in general, when you're using Insta360 Studio, um, the recommended minimum spec would be an i7 computer with 16 gig RAM and four gig graphics. That's if you're doing video. Um, but if you're doing photos as well, right now I have an i7 computer and it's still taking some time to load 160 uh, raw photos. So you still need a powerful computer uh, if you want to process all these files. So now you can see that it's starting to load. And while that's loading, I'll see if there's any questions. So a question from Rennie Matthew, one shot cameras will get high dynamic range. Some cameras we can see is getting pixels while zooming. So that's a good question. And I think camera manufacturers like Insta360 are aware that uh, they have a very small sensor in their camera and they're trying their best to find new ways to keep the sensor small so they keep the camera small and yet get as much dynamic range as possible. And the way they're doing this is by using AI um, and lots of different types of photo modes. So let's take um, HDR, for example. Even uh, Ricoh and um, QCAM 8K have HDR photo modes. And by blending a photo that's dark, bright, and one in between, you can get a higher dynamic range photo. So using the photo modes available by the camera manufacturer will give you a better result. And I think you're talking about pixels, which is uh, resolution. So think about where your work is going to be displayed. If it's going to be displayed on social media like Facebook, then most people are probably going to be viewing these photos on their phone. And this, the real estate of a 360 photo is a square on this screen. So generally, the audience isn't going to zoom in and look around unless they are professionals trying to pixel peep the photo. If your audience is just generally people looking, scrolling through Facebook, as long as they see something good, like the message or story, then the quality doesn't matter. So it kind of depends what you're taking the photos for. I understand if you're doing uh, luxury tours, then you might want a bit more higher quality. But if you're doing kind of virtual tours and you want to show a space, I do think the HDR photo modes on even these small cameras like the Insta360 are more than good enough to show and tell uh, your message that, let's say, here's the swimming pool in this house. It's this big and you can see it. Or here's the living room and this is where you can imagine yourself watching TV. Or here's the kitchen where you can imagine someone, um, you know, this is where you would make food. So as long as you get those messages across to the viewer, um, that's all that really matters, I think. So I know that Candel has a mode called Super HDR. Um, and they use in computational photography to try and get as much dynamic range as possible by combining lots of different photos. So go through your camera manufacturer's photo modes and look out for HDR and use that to get the highest dynamic range. 
All right, so back to making our time lapse now. So I've now imported all these photos into Insta360 Studio. And the next thing we want to do is very similar to what we did in the first workflow with one photo. So stitching the fisheye lens view into a echo rectangular view, we need to do it for all these raw photos now. So to batch export all these photos, just select one photo, hit Control A on the keyboard, and this will select all the photos on the side. Then in the top right hand corner, click Start Export. Set the target resolution to original, so you get your original photo quality. And I always uncheck the horizontal correction. I think it's better to do it in the video editing software. Then I'm going to save all these photos to a folder, and I'm going to save it to my time-lapse demo folder. So first of all, I had all of these raw photos on the side in my first folder, which is called one raw photos. And then I'm going to store all these stitch folders in a folder called two dash stitched raw photos. And this, this would just help me understand and organize my file so I know which one's which. So I would open this folder and save all my files in here. So I would select this folder, click OK, and then all these photos will begin batch exporting. Now it is going to take a very long time, so I'm not going to do it live on this presentation. So I'm just going to cut to when they've all been stitched together. So now that that's been done, you can leave Insta360 Studio. And I'll go to my second folder with the stitched raw photos. So now I have all these photos, which are part of my time-lapse video. The next step is to color grade these photos. And the easiest way to do this is using Lightroom, because in Lightroom, you can apply color grade to many pictures at once. So to do this, I'm going to open Lightroom. And then in the Library tab, just waiting for it to load. I'm going to click Import. Then I'm going to locate the folder with my stitched DNGs. Over here. I'm going to click Check All because I want to import all these photos and click Import. There are a lot of photos, and you can see it's taking some time to load, even on my machine, which is an i7, 16 gig RAM, and more than 4 gig of graphics. So you do need a powerful computer even to do this. Then I'm going to go to the Develop tab. And this is where you can color grade your photos. So I'm going to go to the first photo in my time lapse. and. If you look on the right-hand side, you might notice that these options are very similar to what we had in Photoshop. And it's even got the Auto button over here. So I'm going to click Auto so I get a good starting point. And already, you can see the massive difference that it's made. Um, so let me just go back so you can see the difference. That's before, and this is with after. So the computer does a really good job off the bat, and I think this is the easiest way uh, when you're getting started with color grading photos. And I want to change this green color. So I'm going to go down to my HSL color. And this is the same as what I showed you before, where you can change the color of the sky from a blue to a teal. Um, so over here is your target tool. So if I click it, click the grass and drag it up. I can now change the color to a more evergreen. So this is the before. 
and this is the after. So you can just play around with the colors and make it pop. Now, I'm happy with this color grade. So the next thing I need to do is apply this color grade to all the other photos in my time lapse. So to do this, I'm going to make sure this photo is selected. Click copy, check all, and copy. So now the color grade has been copied. And then I'm going to hit Control A on the keyboard to select all these photos on the bottom. Then I'm going to click Sync and then Synchronize. And now all my photos will have the same color grade. You can see it pasted in the settings over here. And they're all starting to change to the color grade. So if I click these frames, they all have the color grade that I've just pasted. So now that it's all color graded, it's now time to export these photos into JPEGs. Uh, we need JPEGs now because Premiere Pro cannot import raw files, so we must give it JPEGs. And then in Premiere Pro, it will take all the JPEG photos and will tell it to compile all these photos together and turn it into a video. So to export these photos from Lightroom, I'm going to hit Control A on the keyboard so it's all selected. Then go to File, Export. So in the export location, I'm going to make it go to a specific folder. So I'll click Choose. And I'm going to locate the folder with my time lapse. <clears throat> So before we started at the beginning, we started with raw photos, which I labeled number one. Then we stitched it in Insta360 Studio, which is step two. And now we're at step three, where we're taking the stitched raw photos and turning it into JPEG photos. So then in this folder, I'm going to select it and then export all these photos uh, into this folder. Now, again, this is gonna take a lot of time. So I've already done it and I'm not gonna export it right now but all you need to do is click the export button and just make sure it says under file settings, the image format is JPEG and the quality is set to 100. So you got the best quality possible. So then after you click export, it will begin exporting and it can take uh, quite a long time depending on your computer specs. So I'm going to close Lightroom now and once that's finished exporting, you'll have all your JPEG photos. So this is every single frame uh, in the time-lapse sequence. So the next step is now to open Premiere Pro so we can turn these photos into a video. So I'm going to open Premiere Pro. And I'm going to make a new project. I'll just call it time-lapse one. And I'm going to save this in my time-lapse folder. So I'll just save it here and click OK. Now I'm going to import the photos and Premiere Pro will automatically turn it into a video. So to do this, go to your project tab, right click and click import. Go to your third folder, which has your JPEG photos, click the first photo and you'll notice over here, it says image sequence because Premiere Pro has noticed that there is a sequence going on here. So it's, it's plus one, and it knows that all these photos belong together. So make sure this is checked and you have your first photo in the time-lapse selected. Click Open, and then Premiere Pro will automatically turn your photos 
into a time-lapse video. So if I double click this, all the photos have been combined into a video. So now you can see the wheel spinning. So you can see here that the preview is laggy. So if you have a slow computer or your editing is lagging, if you want a more smoother editing experience, then it's best to create a proxy file and this will give you a more smoother video to edit. So to create a proxy file, right click the video, go to proxy, create proxies, change the format to QuickTime, the preset to VR monoscopic proxy, and just choose where you want to save that proxy to. So I'm gonna save it to my time-lapse folder over here and select this folder and click OK. And this will open up Media Encoder. So it's making a smaller file of the original file and Premiere Pro will use the smaller file to edit with in this window. But when you export your final time-lapse video, it will change the smaller file for the larger high resolution file so you get the best quality possible. So right now that's converting. And while that's converting, the next thing I'm going to do is create a 4K sequence, 16 by nine video for YouTube. So I can put my reframed 360 time-lapse in it so people can view it on YouTube. So to do this, I'm going to click new sequence. I'm going to click the drop down for digital SLR, the drop down for 1080p and select DSLR 1080p 30. Then go to settings, change the frame size to 3840 by 2160. And this will give you your 4K 16 by nine aspect ratio for YouTube. And then I'll click OK. And then I will click this video icon and drag it into my timeline. And I'll keep the existing settings. So now I have the 360 video in my 4K timeline. And if you want to see it play smoothly with your proxy file, then you need to add the proxy button in your button toolbar over here. So to do this, click the button editor. And this button is your toggle proxies button. You just need to drag it into the toolbar over here and click OK. And now if I play back this video, it will play back in real time. So you can see a much better preview of your time-lapse video and it won't stutter. So the next thing I'm going to do is reframe this time-lapse. So we have like a motion time-lapse. So to do this, I'm going to go to effects. I'm going to look for the GoPro effects reframe plugin. Now this is a separate download and you need to download it from GoPro's website and I'll be sure to leave a link somewhere so you can download it. I'm going to drag this onto the time-lapse video, then go to effect controls and go to the GoPro Effects Reframe plugin. I'm going to change the projection to 3840 by 2160, so it matches our 4K frame. And then we have some parameters over here. So pan will move the video left and right. So I'm gonna click and drag it left and then right. The tilt will move the video up and down. The rotation will turn the video anti-clockwise or clockwise. The lens curve will get rid of distortion. So the number you want to set it to is 65 or 70. And then all the fisheye distortion will be removed. So you can see that the lines just stretched out. And the zoom will zoom out the video and zoom in. So I'll just keep this at 100 for now. The next thing you need to do is add keyframes. Now keyframes are like pivot points in the Insta360 app. And these keyframes basically tell the software, this is the view I want to show my audience at this point in time. 
So right now we're at the beginning of this shot and I actually want to start my shot over here looking at this view. So I'm going to click the stopwatch icon for all these options so that Premiere Pro knows this is the view I want to show my audience at the beginning. And then I'm going to scroll to almost the end of the shot and I'm going to change the pan to look towards the London Eye. And then I'm going to change the tilt to look up to the London Eye. And whenever you add a keyframe for one of these options, it's always best practice to add a keyframe for these other options, even though you're not going to change the values. And this will just make it easy on the eye when you're looking at all these keyframes in a row. And then I'm going to draw a box around these keyframes to select it all, and then just drag it to the end of the shot. So at the start of the shot, it starts here. And at the end of the shot, it ends at the London Eye. So if I play back this clip, you now have a time-lapse shot, which looks like this. And it's pretty cool how with a 360 camera, you don't need to worry about the framing during the time-lapse. You do the reframing in post. So, you know, if you want to, you can go uh, from the sky to look down and then across, or we can look towards the other side of the London Eye. There's just so many possibilities. Um, if you want to, you can make a tiny planet time-lapse. So to do this, I'll just get rid of the keyframes at the end, set the lens curve to zero, change the tilt to minus 90 and zoom out. And I'll pan to put the eye on top. And then you can achieve the tiny planet effect time lapse. And if you want to make it a hamster wheel, all you need to do is change the tilt to 90 instead. And it turns into an inverted wheel instead. So those are the different ways you can customize your time lapse uh, in Premiere Pro using the GoPro FX reframe plugin. Now, the last thing to do is to export your time lapse video in the highest video quality possible. So let's say this is the final video which you want to export. Click the sequence, go to File, Export, Media. For the format, select H.265. For the preset, select 4K Ultra HD. Output name is where you select where you want to save your video to. So just select your time-lapse folder. Leave the basic video settings as it is and scroll down to bitrate settings. Now over here, change the target bitrate all the way to 60 and change the quality to high and then export your video. And when you put this on YouTube, this will give you the best quality possible. And that's how I upload all my YouTube videos. I do it using uh, H.265 and I found that it gives me better results than H.264. So that's it. That's how you edit a raw photo in Photoshop and that's how you make a time-lapse video using Lightroom and Premiere Pro. So let's take a look at your questions. So Karen, if you want to jump in and help me out, uh, if, do, if you, do you have a list of questions to go through? Yeah, so I think um, I think you already answered Ricardo's emails regarding um, 360 video and and you know YouTube, right? So we know we can interact um, with the 360 video on YouTube and um, Instagram. Did you 
did you talk about Instagram? Did I miss that? No. Instagram? Yeah. So Ricardo is asking if 360 photos can be uploaded to Instagram. Um, so you can't upload it as an, a 360 photo, which you can scroll around. Uh, but you can, let's say, use the reframing technique that I used in Premiere Pro to show people um, to basically look around for them. So you can turn your photo into a video, for example. So using the GoPro FX reframe plugin, you can show people all around your photo in, let's say, 15 seconds so that they don't have to scroll around. So that could be a workaround for Instagram. So I'm just reading through the rest here. I know that there was a bunch that came up. Um, the, that I think you answered as we were going. And um, yeah, I think Javier has a good question. If you know any other Windows tools to create time lapse, is is Premiere the the main um, the main tool, or are there other ones that you know are there free? editors that you can use do you know of or anything? i think specifically for um if we're going for the highest uh photo quality possible which is taking uh interval photos using our 360 cameras then the workflow i showed you right now is probably one of the only workflows available to do this um and that's the thing, this industry is so new that there's not much tools out there to accomplish what we want. So right now, Premiere Pro and the GoPro FX Reframe plugin is the best way to uh, create a time-lapse video. There's no other way uh, to do it. Although uh, recently I have experimented with DaVinci Resolve and I have managed to import a raw time-lapse into it but I just haven't used it enough to talk about it yet, but it, it has worked, but there are some limitations with that as well. So maybe uh, Resolve might be an option in the future as well, which is free, but then I think they will limit the resolution to a certain amount. But that's something I'll talk about a little bit later when I'm more comfortable with the workflow. Yeah, that's cool. I, I've done uh, time lapses in Final Cut Pro, uh, but I'm a Mac user, yeah. so I don't know. And uh, it's also not free. So. <laughs> yeah, and I haven't tried it in Final Cut Pro yet, so I'm not entirely sure. That's oh, pretty nice. It's a nice workflow. Oh, Ricardo says that um, that you that you missed uh, what you meant about YouTube. I don't know if you see this here. He says, "I meant how can I upload a 360 video to YouTube that uh, the views can change um, the." So I think he's wondering if you can interact with you know, so you can interact with it. Is that what you're asking, Ricardo? If you so that you can manipulate it and, and spin it around. The views can change the viewpoints live. Could you clarify what you mean by that? Yeah, I think the it could be so hmm. I oh, I see. Okay, predetermined by the keyframes. So it's Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think I do get this question a lot. I think I know what Ricardo is talking about. So can you have a more interactive experience with the 360 video where you you choose uh, what's in view? Is that? 
<laughs> You've stumped us, Ricardo. <laughs> <laughs> Cockpit three six. Well, we'll go. We'll we'll take. We'll, um, uh, I'll I'll check out cockpit um uh uh three sixty. Shanil, and you can maybe take on another question in the meantime. We can come All back right. to you, Ricardo. I uh, see a question from one about Photoshop rather than in Lightroom. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, see. Photoshop is good if you want to edit a single photo, but then Lightroom is good if you need to process lots of photos at once, uh, like color grading. So Photoshop gives you that ability to look around your 360 photo and take out the near day, which is very, very powerful um, and probably the best tool you can get uh, to do that, uh, to make your photos look very polished. So it kind of depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you're just trying to edit one photo, then probably Photoshop is better. Um, Lightroom, if you're trying to edit multiple photos, it's like you kind of do need both in a sense. Uh, which mobile photo editing apps would you recommend? I think there's Lightroom on mobile, uh, which is probably the best because Lightroom has the same controls that I talked about, uh, which you can use. So it's probably the most like intuitive because we already know about it. Um, so uh, re if you don't mind, if I if I step yeah. in, Ricardo, uh, uh, Chanel, this uh, Ricardo. Uh, yeah, I think um, uh, the link you sent, but I, I think what you mean is just the plain old interaction, right? So, you know, interacting, when you upload a 360 video, it should have the right metadata so that YouTube knows it's a 360 video. There's a, um, and then, it, then it'll be interactive and you can spin it around. Yeah. And yeah, the link that you sent, I'm getting a four, oh no, right. Okay, yeah, I see. So it's just um, a matter of having the right metadata and then choosing that it's a 360 video when you go into YouTube. Yeah, I tried the link, it didn't work. But if you upload a 360 video onto YouTube, then um, there won't be any keyframes determining which way to look, as the viewer can look uh, wherever they want in the 360 video. Yeah, once you have a when, once you have a, a two to one ratio uh, um, video, and you just upload it, and it should have it should work. Okay, so I think Ricardo wants to upload a three hundred and sixty video onto YouTube where the viewer can just look around. So, which camera are you using? Because it kind of depends on the the software. I mean, any if you use a Insta three hundred and sixty camera and you export your INSV file from Insta360 Studio, then it will turn it into a 360 video, which you can then upload onto YouTube, which has the metadata to turn it into that immersive 360 format. Yeah, so X2, um, Insta360 Studio will do that for you. You just need to upload it and it should turn into one automatically without any other software. No, not silly at all. I mean. This session is meant for beginners, people that are new into 360. And I want to help, you know, the bridge from 2D cameras to 360 cameras is uh, quite a big learning curve. Not many people know about it. And I think that's one of the things that stops people going from 2D to 360. So that's why I set up Best 360 all those years ago, because I think this is really cool tech. But not many people know how to bridge the gap between the, the technical and the creativity. So that's why I'm there to help people bridge that gap. And, you know, it's, it's something that um, it's not obvious until you know it. So, yeah, because it wasn't, it wasn't the case a few years ago when Insta360 Studio wouldn't give you the metadata, you would have to use other software. So it's, it's definitely a valid question. So I just want to um, also in, uh, interject again and uh, 
just want to say maybe it's a good time to, to wrap it up. Uh, we're at uh, an hour and a half or so. So I think there's still a few more questions to answer, but maybe one or two more questions. And uh, I think we can call it a day. Okay, sure. Are there any specific questions you want me to answer? Is there any in Q&A? Um, I think the, um, there was one, I saw one about real, yeah, Juan had asked about, you know, if you, if you were familiar with any kind of special workflow recommendations for real estate one-shot photography, if this, you know. If okay. Can... Good question. Something I need to experiment with, but I know that Insta360 is making it easier to process raw files on your phone and i know i keep talking about insta360 it's just that i don't have a rico camera um <laughs> and i've got a qcam and the reason i always talk about insta360 is because their workflow is the easiest so when i teach beginners i always tend to lean towards an insta360 camera because it's just easier to use and it's easier for people to bridge the gap between 2d and 360 and recently i saw on the app that um when i tap on a raw file, it actually opens up and I can see the preview of my raw file. Now that wasn't the case a year ago. You had to open a raw file on the computer and process it. But now you can open a raw file on the app and export it as a photo, which is pretty great. So I'm sure they are working on ways to make the workflow mobile friendly so that you don't need to go through Photoshop, Lightroom uh, to export really good photos for real estate. Because even right now, you can take that raw photo, export it on your phone, and you know, upload it uh, onto social media straight away. And I think that kind of speedy workflow would be really great for real estate um, when you've got to do you know lots and lots of houses. So I think watch that space because that workflow is getting easier and easier, and it's soon going to be a mobile workflow. Like I wouldn't, if I had to do this again next year, I bet I would be teaching you from a mobile and not a desktop. For sure. Oh, I think we'll have to hold you to that then in a year from now and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, um, uh, yeah, this has been a really wonderful um, uh, tutorial webinar. This was, this was great. I don't, I, um, I've learned uh, more <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I think also it'll, we'll probably move into a, into a more mobile <laughs> world, right? Into mobile I think so. editing. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you all for joining me. And I hope you all learned something new today. And for all of you starting off as beginners, like I said before, don't worry about the quality. Worry about your story and message. If you take a photo of something fascinating, everyone will want to know about it and it will get featured. So. Don't think about is the quality good enough? Think about is your story or message clear enough? That's the main takeaway, I think. And if you want to contact me about any questions, um, I am available on literally any social media. So whichever one you prefer, I'm on Facebook, um, YouTube, Twitter. You know, feel free to join the Best 360 Club on Facebook. You can ask me questions there. And that's a place where you guys can share your photos and that group is for anyone. It's for beginners. And we want to see people go from beginners to pro. So, you know, it takes, you need to take bad photos to eventually take good photos. You need to see the progress. So don't be afraid to upload your photos, um, whether bad or really bad, upload them because over time you will see the progress that you've made. And there's nothing better than seeing how you've improved over time, that you're taking better photos week after week. If you don't upload them, you're never going to see that progress and it won't motivate you to do better next time. So put it out there, show the world how bad you started off with and then how good you got just a couple of months down the line watching Best 360 videos. I'm joking, but you know, you know what I mean. So, <laughs> um, yeah, take care, stay safe. And uh, I will be making similar topics on Best 360 YouTube channel soon. So... Thank you guys so much for sticking with me today. 
Thank you so much, Chanel. This was really great. And I and uh, yeah, the takeaway for sure. That's a that's the best tech takeaway. So thanks thanks for that. And um, thank you for everyone for joining us here at uh, at the IVRPA. Um, you know, like I said, we are a nonprofit organization trying to push uh, 360 um, media to the world, um, and we're all volunteers. So, um, you know, if you're curious and you want to get involved, um, you can find us at ivrpa.org. And yeah, so with that, uh, we'll close. And thanks again. Oh, and I also wanted to thank um, uh, Juan and Tanya, who are in the background, also working on this, um, also part of the team. It's not just me and, and everyone else at IVRPA. So um, thank you to you guys behind the scenes also. Okay. Yeah, thanks, everyone. <laughs> Great. Okay. Everyone take care, and thanks a lot. All right. See you later. Bye. <laughs>